Hello, hello, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am Leila Jalali. Uh, I am engineering manager at Google. I've been a member of Kubernetes community for three, four years now. And I'm so proud to be a member of this amazing community here. Stefan is with me. Today we are going to talk about API machinery, the SIG overview. The first part of the talk is overview, introduction, how you can involve, get involved and help us. And um, uh, then Stefan will have two topics and a demo, amazing demo. Uh, let's start. Uh, okay, so. Nope. <laughs> Nice. Okay, where are we on the journey? Uh, Kubernetes started 2013, 2014, and now after 10 years, we have 83,000 contributors, and 96% of organizations are using Kubernetes or evaluating it. And um, the blue line shows the search term on Google for Kubernetes API server, and you see that it's increased over time. Um, there are many projects in Kubernetes, and API machinery is one of the important six of Kubernetes. Uh, here you see the overview of what is going on on cluster in Kubernetes, and uh, the center is Cube API server, and we have a scheduler to schedule um, the pods without assigned nodes. We have controller manager, and different controllers have uh, um, uh, the, uh, are all com uh, compiled into a single binary in controller manager. We have cloud controller manager for uh, cloud specific um, the, uh, logic and the node and kubelet, kube proxy for, to implement the Kubernetes service logic or the network rules. And what do uh, we have for API machinery is highlighted here. Some of the controllers are in API machinery, not all of them, the controller manager, parts of the machinery to uh, create the objects and the APIs, and uh, all the communications on the cluster are, goes through this Cube API server. Um, now the question is why uh, we see like uh, this API machinery everywhere, and it reminds me of this picture of Lion King. Um, every where light touch is API machinery. I see this like everywhere in Kubernetes. And this is from our charter. Uh, SIG API machinery is responsible for the development and enhancement of Kubernetes cluster control plane. This scope uh, includes the API server, the persistent layer, or the data store for Kubernetes, the controller manager, cloud controller manager, CRDs, webhooks, and more. Uh, API machinery doesn't mean all the APIs in Kubernetes. That is a misconception. And uh, we own some of the APIs. We know about the APIs. We might be able to answer some of the questions on the APIs, but not all the individual APIs owned by API machinery. And the charter that, uh, and that link has the detailed list of what uh, owned by API machinery the mechanisms to read, modify, delete, um, the objects, parsing, conversions, defaulting, validation, uh, the open API, discovery, CRDs, webhooks, client informer libraries, and how to maintain the healthy system that is very important, the controller manager, garbage collection, the namespace cluster lifecycle, and our new um, SIG, which is SIG etcd, and also scalability, they all own that persistent layer of data store. And what is out of scope, I already mentioned that those individual APIs, how to work with them, the applications, are out of, spoke, uh, out of the scope for the API machinery. Uh, now the question is why API machinery is so complex? The onboarding is so hard. This was one of the com most complex projects that I worked on, and everyone knows that this is very uh, difficult. It is hard to contribute, and um, let's take a look at why this is the case. This is a Kubernetes cluster. We have the control plane. In the center, we have this API center, 
And the controller manager, cloud controller manager, scheduler, etcd layer, there we built some uh, extensions to work on uh, the things on the control plane, the things that are outside the control plane, and there are different users there that are, that, that are that might be human users, that might be clients that are just like Python client, other things. We build these extensions uh, for the things that are in the control plane or outside. Each of these uh, uh, things in the control plane have its own process, and they, uh, it adds to the complexity. Then, um, to build a system that is highly available and fault tolerant, we have the replicas of this, uh, for example, three or more replicas. So we make sure if the control plane is failed, uh, another control plane makes sure the cluster is up and running. So we have different instances of uh, the cluster and the control plane and the API server. And all this communication goes through API server. And this etcd uh, connects through like it's stacked etcd nodes or external etcd nodes that adds to the complexity. For the load balancing, there are cloud specify, uh, like cloud provider specific load balancing, uh, literal action things. But you see this picture shows the complexity when you have different components, each might have different version of Kubernetes. And now there are the questions about what would be the maximum version SKU and uh, the need for safer upgrades in Kubernetes. Uh, one of the examples when I was thinking about the complexity was uh, the aggregated discovery. And this picture is from OpenAPI 2022, uh, where um, when, whenever the clients make the calls for the aggregated Discover, for the discovery, the discovery objects were so small and there were so many of them, there were so many API calls to get all those uh, objects and uh, to know what is available on the cl cluster, like the operation, operations. And then in 2023, the, uh, another layer of aggregation built on top of uh, the server that uh, all the services from the client were uh, to ask for the uh, discovery goes through the aggregated endpoint. That means that the latency that we saw in those API calls removed, the performance increased, and you see how much this picture is simple uh, by just uh, having that. And there were alternatives to aggregated discovery, to uh, alternative implementation that the team went through and worked on that. Uh, Jeff uh, Ying, uh, Anton Bliss, and uh, uh, Alex Zelensky was part of that. So you see one thing, one proposal, how it connects to so many different things in API machinery, and that is one of the reasons that it is complex. Uh, we um, had two approaches to see how much code uh, do we own. The first one was using SIG labels, and we said this SIG labels might be introduced into the T18, so we went through another approach that was like file cataloging, and we got um, 25 to 40% of the code ownership for API machinery, depending on which approach we use. This is huge, and this is another reason why we see this complexity. This is uh, from uh, 1.29 enhancement tracking. We have different things going on. Uh, the things related to performance, priority and fairness uh, by, I think, uh, Mike Spencer uh, to generalize the API request to get, have the priority and uh, queues for each priority, then Cibor ser serializer from Ben, the work from Ben, and then we have the informers, the work from uh, Locus to get the, the stream of data. Uh, the work on Cell, Cell is a huge project. Uh, CC uh, is working on that. Jiahui uh, Feng, CC has a talk tomorrow. Uh, it is around noon on declarative everything. I really encourage everyone to join that talk. And uh, there, Stefan will talk about some parts of Cell today, uh, the work that Alex Zelensky is working on. And then we have things related to maintenance, things uh, for SLO improvement, the support for uh, list queries uh, for the Kubernetes API, and also the work for the, to support WebSockets that uh, Sean Selvan is leading that. And uh, these are the main work. There are other works that are going on. The uh, aggregated discovery was one of them that I uh, already talked about. And um, 
Now, um, I talk about like uh, who uh, is the leadership of the SIG. We have David Eads and Federico Bongiovanni. They are six uh, um, chairs, and uh, for the SIG TEALs, we have Joe Bates and David Eads. Um, they are working tremendously with the people in the team and um, all the projects and the directions of the SIG. Uh, they are helping and uh, giving guidance and. Um, they are awesome to work with. Uh, then, uh, we, how you can get involved if you are uh, thinking about joining and working on something. We have these SIG meetings like other SIGs. This is uh, like 60 minute meeting that is bi weekly. And then we have the bike triage meeting, which is twice a week. This is a great way to join us and uh, focus on how we can get involved, not only on the like, issues that are raised, but the tasks that are helping the more like um, larger projects. Uh, we have the working groups uh, that are API expression, Cube Builder, the working group that is for sell is very active and they have their own meetings, their own Slack channels and communications. Uh, there is upcoming project-based mentorship program. Uh, we had a list of uh, mentors and a list of projects. We are going to announce this and people can apply for this mentorship program. It is three to six months, one-to-one -one mentorship and, uh, and it is project-based because we want those larger projects to have more people, but it doesn't mean that you can uh, not suggest other projects. We are uh, there to see the ideas. Uh, we hope to uh, have this program kick off uh, next year in January. And with that, I think I uh, give it to Stefan. To yeah, so uh, you have seen all the caps, um, lots of work going on. I want to highlight two topics, um, two caps, which are a bit under the radar, um, not so feature heavy, but um, one is more like about the philosophy of what we are doing. And the second one is uh, about CIDs. Everybody uses CIDs. Validation plays a role. Everybody knows the pain of changing validation. So this is the uh, second topic. So first one, um, philosophy I said, um, um, that's a cap 4080. Um, it's not really a feature thing. It's more like a code reorganization. It's about um, building or extracting something from Kubernetes, adding a new layer. Um, in the layers we already have, so everybody knows Kate as API server, for example, as one layer, one repository. And at the end, there is, of course, Kube API server. Kube API server uses um, the API extension API server, the aggregator, and then, of course, the actual APIs of Kube. And what we are doing here is um, adding another layer called a generic control plane. Basically, um, building a cluster, like um, an API server with controllers, which feels like Kube, but there are no pods, no networking, nothing, nothing which is basically uh, pod-related. And um, yeah, it feels natural to have that. Today, everything in Kube API server is basically hardwired. So um, you can do that, and people have done it. But um, you have to fork basically Kube API server to do it. And this approach is, or this attempt is to, to make this clearer and um, allow use of Kubernetes for our other purposes, but also to improve the code quality. Like Kube API Server is really, it's a big sp spaghetti ball with um, everything is connected to everything basically. So it's very hard to understand and this layer will help. Um, it's ongoing, so there are some changes in 128, um, some 29. It's not finished yet, so it's ongoing work. The basic idea, and this is not really, um, it's a sketch, right? So um, we might have or might get a new staging repository called generic control plane, um, but don't take this by word yet. It's, it might be called a little bit different, or this is just a sketch for the direction we want to go to, like the vision. And um, what we want to put there is basically um, what we have in those packages today. So there's control plane API server in KK today, and there's Kube API server options, Kube API server admission. And if you look into them, um, they are kind of generic already. Interestingly, package control plane is not generic, so it's a big, I, I mean, we, we inherited that, or we, we named those packages um, years ago when there was not, not such a plan, uh, plan, so they're not really um, representing what we have put into those packages, and we will change that, um, that's part of this uh, 4080, um, 4080 uh, cap, and basically when you think about what is a generic control plane, you will come to something like that. CRDs obviously are generic namespaces. 
are generic. Some of the resources in core, like secrets, config maps, um, all the authorization is generic. Service accounts, the whole admission um, stack, and we have many things like webhooks and policies nowadays, it's, it's uh, generic. Quota is mostly generic. Aggregation API services um, as well. And of course, for all those APIs, um, you have controllers um, which are running. And some of them are really, I mean, you basically need them for a cluster which feels like you garbage collection, for example. Um, things should go away when you remove um, an owner of an object, and the children should be also removed. Namespace deletion is a thing you just expect from a cluster. And if you want to have um, resource quota, there's a quota controller plus an admission plugin to do that. So this is basically um, what you want to have. Um, get something like a cube control plane with those features. But some of them are obviously are, are optional. So you can think of basically, um, depending on the purpose of your control plane, you don't want authorization because you have a different mechanism for authorization. Or secrets and config maps don't make sense. Um, or you don't want extensibility. Maybe you don't want admission webhooks at all because you have everything coded in Go. Um, so all those things can be disabled. And the idea is to make this much easier than today. So um, quick demo. It's not super extensive, but let me see. Just want to give you a flavor of what we are doing. So if you have seen um, or built an API server, there's this very central method. It's called uh, create server chain. And um, basically, what, is, uh, what, what this is doing is it takes a CID API server, so the ex API extension um, creates that one, and then it um, puts another API server in front, namely that's a Cube API server, so the main one of Cube, like uh, the one which implements config maps and secrets and other things. And the third one is usually the aggregator. So the aggregator is um, yeah, what uh, has been shown before. It, it serves discovery, uh, aggregated discovery. It serves open API and those things. Um, so it's pretty central, actually. It's not only implementing aggregation, like redirecting to other servers. It's doing much more in Kubernetes. And those three make up um, Cube APIs server, basically. And, um, yeah, you can run this thing. So um, this is a it's a prototype. It's not uh, merged yet. So um, yeah, just to show, um, most of you will know the test server which we have integration tests. So you can you can run that and um, see what comes out. So if you run that, um, it just prints as a test um, the APIs which we have. So all the API groups and resources here, config maps, secrets. Um, service uh, accounts and so on, everything which is part of an API server. And you already notice there are things like um, priority and fairness, for example, which um, kind of is, is essential for a control plane if you want to have uh, priorities um, in request handling. So there are things, also leases, which is unexpected. So there are some things um, which belong to a control plane. And we'll come to that, what a control plane actually is uh, in a second. And um, what I tried, I took that and uh, I wanted to go one step further. So what is a minimal control plane which uh, we can build that way? So I did the same thing, the same experiment. And remove things and hope that it doesn't crash. So like authorization doesn't crash because there's no airbag anymore, right? Those things you have to fix. And um, you see the list is already a lot shorter. So this could be basically a very minimal control plane. And um, it would work, right? But it's, it's not so simple. Like, um, I just showed quickly. If you, if you launch that um, completely and you wait for readiness of the API server, you will notice it will not start. Like, you see all those reflector issues here. You see endpoints and services. And you will, you will think about why endpoints and services, where are they even used, right? But you will find out our aggregation layer, cube aggregator, it uses pods and secrets, right? So you need those concepts to even, to even run aggregation. So there's more work to do. Like, we, if we want to do that, we would need an aggregator which is not aggregating. It's not redirecting anywhere else or with a different mechanism, whatever. So there's more work to do than just disabling APIs. All right. So let's go back. Um, so what is a minimal cube control plan? And this is a philosophical topic, right? Um, we have just seen that. This was generic, the first one, the first example. Um, everybody will agree this is a control plane. This feels like a Kubernetes cluster when you, when you work with it. Um, it has everything, I mean, not the, the, the workload resources, but it has everything else, basically. It's extensible, like you can have CIDs, you can have uh, admission webhooks and policies. Um, those things are complete uh, in that cluster. You have uh, Airbag and you have authentication, so you can call out to another um, authorization webhook, uh, authentication webhook, all those things work, right? 
But um, yeah, is this a control plane? The manual one, the second example I had, I would say yes. Um, you don't have CIDs anymore, so I just disabled this part where I instantiate the API extension API server. And what you are left with is basically those hard-coded Golang APIs. Um, if you want to use that, you could do it, um, but you have to implement basically your APIs in Go. So, but this could be a valid use case, right? Um, if you look in the ecosystem, people are doing experiments, and they call that Kubernetes. Like, they have implementations which very much look like Kubernetes. So one, I'm not sure people have seen that. There's this tool tilt. Um, I think it's owned by Docker now. Um, if you use the command line tool and you say API resources, it will show you cube resources. This is an API server. And to my knowledge, it's using Kubernetes. So if anybody knows about that, I'm happy to hear. But if you look on the API resources, this is super minimal. There is no um, airbag anymore. There is no, not even a namespace exists, right? So it's super minimal, and is this Kubernetes? Uh, is this an API server we could call Kubernetes? So it's an open question. And um, to my knowledge, as I said, this uses Kubernetes under the hood. And you can go one step further. So Archon was just announced I know, a week ago or so. Um, and Darren, um, the author, or the main author of this tooling, um, he implements APIs which are kubectl compatible, even controller compatible. So you can run informers against that. So they support uh, all the quads, including watches. But it's not Kube API server. It's not API machinery. There are some parts they, they borrow from API machinery, but it's, um, it's a, yeah, it implements the, the API, but it's not Kube anymore. So I wouldn't call that a Kube cluster. There's no feeling of a cluster. So you don't um, you use that, you use kubectl to do quad, but that's basically it. And so that's a philosophical question whether we call that um, a minimal control plane. What is this? And um, of course, there's a question to, to the SIG, and um, that's a question basically for the ecosystem. Do we want to support those things, those experiments? Maybe, maybe could be part of the SIG, or we, we leave that as contributions outside. Um, nothing to answer today, but um, just want to show that. All right, that's the first topic. Um, second one is about CIDs, very concrete. Um, 4008 is a cap, and um, Alex basically showed up a uh, few months ago and said, uh, I hate how we do validation in Cube. It's so awkward to change validations. And most of you will probably uh, have experienced that themselves. Like when you um, strengthen or weaken validation for a field, you always have to think there is something in etcd already, so users might have objects which don't validate anymore. And the consequences of that are pretty um, yeah, uh, extreme. So we will see it in a second. So it's an, ex uh, it's an example here, um, yeah, a custom resource definition with a schema. And it has two fields, replicas and IPs. Don't ask me about the context here. It's just made up. But replicas, is, it's obviously a number. And um, IPs is a string, right? So many people start like that. Um, generate with Cube Builder usually, and they get a schema, and they're happy. And then users put something in, um, into the fields, like 2.5. Um, IPs which have five components. Obviously, um, doesn't make sense. It's not what we wanted, right? But people have um, created those objects in the cluster. So um, they are in etcd. And if you now uh, go ahead in the next version, you realize, OK, I forgot the minimum. That's the first mistake. And um, the type number was maybe not good. Integer is much better, right? For the IP, um, I want a format, or a regex, or something like that. So I want to restrict it to real IPs. And what will happen, those objects are basically immutable. So when those fields have those, um, yeah, those strange values, you cannot edit the spec anymore, because validation fails. Um, you cannot even annotate. Like, if you have a tool which annotates objects, this will fail, because the spec has invalid values. And um, there can be like machinery issues finalizers. If there are finalizers in those objects, you can't remove them because the spec is invalid. So it's a very bad situation. And we are living with that for years, right? So um, yeah, but CL. So CL solves everything, right? So um, if I want to strengthen validation, why can't I just do it in, C uh, in cell and basically reference um, the old self, right? No, doesn't work. No, it works. OK, maybe not. So um, use the mouse cursor here. So he, you, you reference old self, and you check that um, old self, like in the example of replicas, it was not an integer before. And if it wasn't one before, hasn't been one before, 
I'm fine with that, right? I don't um, issue or show an error. This is basically what this is saying. If it's not an integer in the old self, then I don't care, but it, if it had been, has been an integer before, then I want to check. And if it's not the case, um, I show the error. Only integers are allowed. And I try the same thing, of course, um, for the IPs. And you will realize when you're trying that, this is not what you want, actually, because um, in the moment you reference old self, this is an update rule, which means it's not um, validated on create which means it's not what you want because you want new objects to follow the rules, right? So um, what you find out quickly, you cannot express that with the CL we have. So it was an oversight kind of, um, but you cannot express it. So we need something new. And um, what we came up with, um, so this is ma mainly Alex work, so he's, all, he's pushing that topic and doing all the development of the theory and the implementation. Um, what we came up with, or mostly Alex came up with, um, we validate per field. And we call it ratcheting. Ratcheting validation is something we have in Go um, everywhere today. It's like we, we, sometimes we introduce some new validation and we check that the old object um, validated and then the new one also has to validate. So we do that in code, but, but we haven't done it in CIDs. So the idea is um, when replicas um, are not changed, like replicas um, keep the value 2.5 in the example, then this green box is not required. Um, same thing for the IP, so on field level. Basically, you look on uh, the open API schema and this applies to the field it's um, specified in. And we call that, obviously, ratcheting. And you see this graphic here. Um, this is the, the, the logic behind. In the moment you validate once, it must validate all the time in the future. Um, Sometimes this is not enough. Sometimes we need more logic. And uh, as we have seen, CL and, uh, alone is not um, able to, to express those things. So um, CL gets an extension. It's called optional old self. And those rules are not update rules anymore. They are um, checked on update and on create. And you have this has value and value function on the old self to express what you want to express. So this way, you can um, basically define arbitrary ratcheting validation rules. So this is um, better in 1.29, um, and yeah, for that reason. So it's, it's available soon. Uh, I hope it helps people writing validations and makes life easier. And what I want to point out here, if you see what um, I just described, this looks super simple, right? But it took months to get the understanding what we actually want. Because you can do much more ratcheting validation, especially the automatic one in CIDs. It's not obvious that this is what we want. So um, there's a lot of work behind, although it looks super simple. And um, yeah, that's why I called it, it's running under the radar. It's something everybody will have soon. And uh, I hope it helps people. So thanks to Alex for all the great work and for pushing or uh, starting this topic. All right, that's it, I think. We have seven minutes left. Um, just to point out, there is a, on Thursday, there is a, um, the old um, meet the six meeting, it's called meet the community's contributor community. Um, three hours, we are there, so if you have any questions about um, any of the caps or anything else, meet us there. Yeah, that's all. Thank you, and we have time for questions, I think. Yes. I'm curious uh, about the similarities between the work that was done in KCP and the generic control plane that you talked about. Can you talk about similarities? Yeah, so KCP uh, did this work manually, right? We, we, uh, Cube didn't support this generic control plane yet. So it's very similar in the sense that um, the work here, which I presented, plus workspaces, this is KCP kind of, maybe plus API bindings. Um, but yeah, it's a similar direction, obviously. Yes. Is there any relationship between the generic control plane and the, the controller runtime library? Or would the latter use I don't think the controller runtime library does anything specific. It just works with the generic control plane. And this is the idea, right? All the tooling in the ecosystem should just work. Controller runtime, things like um, GitOps tools, they should just work because it's, it's a cube cluster, right? But the question is, like the other examples I brought up, which are not clusters, are they compatible with the tooling in the ecosystem? It's not so clear. Right. So. Thank you for your talk, Stefan Leila.
Thank you. Uh, in your estimation, what do you see the future to be in these, these like acorn and tilt that are popping up? Are these built for purpose kind of control planes where you could see maybe they get used in, uh, you know, more for compliance reasons, you know, that are off the map? I mean, it looks a little askew. It doesn't look like it's going to be mainstream to me. But what is your general thought I mean, thinking around it? In Arc One, that's that's their API, right? So you can write, you can use GitOps against Arc One and deploy your applications. So it's their API, and it's even the implementation they use for their controllers, right? So they they like the controller pattern internally, so they want to implement controllers via informers and events, everything. But uh, you know, so um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I have to ask Joe, maybe. Uh, yes, there's something called match conditions on uh, admission web hooks, and we're super excited about it. Um, so you can put a cell expression that sees the old object and the new object and can make any decision it wants about whether to call out to an admission web hook. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Further questions? Um, hey, do you feel with the generic control plane that people could piecemeal specific Kubernetes APIs into their own control planes? And if so, do you think like that modularity would then bleed to making client Go interfaces a bit more modular too? So basically, you can, you can use client go, even if it's big, right, you have all the APIs, you can use it against the control plane just for sequences yeah. works. Um, I don't think there are plans to split it up at the moment. Okay. <laughs> okay, so David, on Thursday. <laughs> and um, whether you can pick APIs from Cube. I mean, this is a, the idea here. I mean, the code is there, right? You can pick yeah. some part. I mean, I picked service accounts just to be part of this, and you could have, I don't know, just the Ingress APIs. You could do that. Whether that makes sense depends on your use case. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, thank you.